Now then, we're going to be in the, the book of John, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. I've been thinking about this and so many things that's been bothering each and every one of us or all of us in a, at different times in our lives. And uh, how strong is your faith? I mean, we faced a lot of, a lot of wolves, haven't we? Faced a lot of trials, we faced a lot of troubles that's come at us. A lot of barriers, so. And what is faith in, in Hebrews 11, 1, before we get started on the text, this is so important to me, brothers and sisters, you've got to have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now that sounds like some, to some that say, well, if I can't see it, well, how can I have faith? Because Jesus Christ says He's coming back. Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit sent it to us. We have faith. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we've asked the Holy Spirit to be indwelled in us, have we not? Amen? His promises are strong and His promises are kept. Faith is one of the most important attributes of our entire lives. We put faith in Jesus. We have access. Whew, that's what I like to eternal life. Without it, scratch that. It's our faith that determines our destiny. And how, it's, how, how do you love the Lord? Do you love Him with all your heart, your soul, your mind? Do you love Jesus Christ? I do. He's my Savior, my King, my God, and I love Him. I love my God. It's our faith that determines our destiny. However, sometimes faith ain't too doggone easy. I've got to tell you, we all are, we are of the flesh. And we're going to have some fear. The writer of Hebrews tells us that faith begins with having the confidence in the things we hope for more than it is having assurance for the things we can't see. Well, this sounds like a contradiction, but trust me, faith actually requires us to believe in something outside ourselves. I've been awful egotistical in my younger days. I thought I was seven foot tall and bulletproof. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. The Lord showed me and humbled me many, many times. And finally, He opened my eyes, put a knot on my head, a cack of stuff, and I rubbed it going, yes, Lord. Who the fuck it? Because that's our Lord. He wants your love. He wants you to be worshiping Him. He wants you to be loving Him. He wants you to let Him love you, guide you, and take you through any and everything this old nasty world has to, to throw at you. Amen? If we could see, see it and measure it, it wouldn't require faith. Amen? Example, God created the earth and all in it, but we weren't there, was it? Were we? We weren't there when it happened. You have faith to happen like the Bible says? Absolutely. Faith to believe it. Jesus said those who believe in Him will inherit eternal life. And brother and sister, that's the most beautiful promise I could ever receive in my life. On this old earthly life. We have to have faith that Jesus will keep that promise and one day, praise Him, we'll be with Him in heaven. That's my goal. I used to have, want to have the goal of being the best cowboy that ever put on a pair of boots, straddle a horse, move cattle. I want to be the best roper I could be, the best hand I could be. In all that time, I was thinking more of me than I was of God. But then I got to thinking how Jesus put me where I was at. I repented from my sins years and years ago. And Jesus has put me, my Lord and Savior has put me in places with people, with people that have guided me along, with good people, good Christian men. And I say that honorably, Christian men, men with integrity, men that live the life right, men that raise their family right. I'm proud to be a part of that. Where does that come from? Jesus Christ. What is He? Same as God. He's love. Amen. All right. Stay in the Scripture and faithfully believe and pray for assurance and confidence in this promise. And brothers and sisters, it'll come true for you. Oh, Father, let's pray. Father, I, I put my faith in You. You and You alone. You're the lifter of my head, Father, the lover of my soul. You're not man and cannot lie. You never failed. If You said, Father, if You said it'll happen again, it will. You are who You say You are and I, and I will do what You say You'll do. You'll do what you say you'll do. I'll do what you tell me to do, Father. Let your Spirit guide me and go down the path you have planned for me. I want to love you, Father, as you have loved me. In your name I pray, amen. 
Hope for troubled hearts. Does anybody here this morning have a troubled heart? Is there anything bothering you? One? I've got a troubled heart. I'm your preacher. There's things, yes, 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 amen. There's things that come across me, yes. And I have to go to God in prayer. I have to talk to Jesus every morning. You're going to laugh at this. You may not. You may do as I do. I get up at 3.33. That's a quiet time. God has designed that time for me because it's happened repetitiously over years and years and years. Lisa's finally learned to sleep through it because he ain't waking her up till, till what is it? Whenever. No, so you got a certain time too. 11, 11, crack a noon. If she, if she gets to sleep that late. But God tells you things, brothers and sisters, if you'll listen. My quiet time is at 3.30 in the morning. And I get up. And I get in the Word. It may not be a lot. It may be a little. It may be a lot. I don't know. I just feel like I need to be with the Lord. And I pray. Talk to Him. Had a fellow ask me yesterday. He said, how do you pray? What's the correct words to say? How do you, how do you pray? Well, I'm one of those cowboys, preachers, that I don't use fancy vernacular. I don't use all the spiffy words that come from the seminary, the cemetery, wherever they, they learn them things, you know, other, other than hard knocks. I pray to God like I'm talking to you. I just use plain old simple language to my Father. I didn't talk to Tommy D. Pascal any different than I talked to the Lord. He's my earthly father, Tommy D. was. But Jesus Christ, God is my earthly father. So you don't have to get fancy. No bells and whistles. He hears your prayer. He can read what's in your mind and your heart. He sees into you. This is a, this is a sobering thought. As you're sitting here looking at me, as I look at you, Jesus Christ looks at you. But He can see deeper than I can. He sees inside of your heart right now. This moment. All moments. Until your life on here, your life on this earth is gone. And uh, I want to read 14, 1 through 14, because I'm going to refer back to these verses in a little bit. If you have your Bible, John 14, 1 through 14, and Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Yes, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, and prepare that place for you. I will come again and receive you myself, that where I am, you also may be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know how to get there. How to get there is not written. That's what we're talking about. And then, old Doubting Thomas. You remember the apostles? Thomas is one of them. Doubting Thomas. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, Jesus looked him right square in the eyeballs. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I know Jesus looked at him. Jesus, uh, he asked, uh, Thomas asked him a question. And Jesus, well, he'll, do, he'll give you a direct answer. That's our Lord. And in verse uh, 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, that from now on you know Him and you have seen Him. Hallelujah. He's telling the disciples, you want to sort, you want what God looks like? You want to know what He looks like? You've seen me, you see the Father. That should, have, that should have made them feel assured. Amen? Well, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? He went in three years, every, every step they took, y'all. You, no, you don't know me yet, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father? I am in the Father, the Father is in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me and does the work. Verse 11, believe me, I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. And now the prayer that we're talking about is answered right here. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is red letters, he who believes in me, the works that I do will, will do also. 
Did you catch that? He who believes in me, the works that I do, you will do also. Hmm. That's pretty strong. Also, greater works these will be because I go to my Father. What does he mean by that right there? Greater works will also be. Well, he's going to be gone. What is what he making disciples to do? To go out and have greater works. We are involved in that. Us sitting here today, we will do greater works than he did. He's gone now, but he's given us the, the, the job. He's given us the opportunity. He's given us the way, the direction to do greater, greater deeds. Meet greater needs for the people. Amen? That's from us going out and evangelizing. Preaching the Word. Talking the Word. Sharing the Word. Loving on somebody that's hurt. Picking somebody up. Giving them that assurance that Jesus gives us. Verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Brothers and sisters, that's why I say it's so important. When we go to the Lord in prayer... We always, always, you want to get God's attention? Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Well, when you say in the name of Jesus, it's something to you, God's got His attention on you. Everything we pray for, we pray for in the name of Jesus. That's why God sent Him here. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one that He hears us. He answers our prayers. He goes to the Father to get our prayers okay. Amen? I don't know if I'm absolutely 110% correct. That's the way I read it in the Bible. And He hears every one of them. Whether you verbally say, Jesus, help me. Yeah. Or Jesus, forgive me. If you think it, He hears it. He knows you. He knows every hair on your head. Every one. Everyone. Some of you guys, He knows every one that used to be there. <laughs> he knows how many was there. Amen. I resemble that. Thank you, Lord. But that's our God. That's our Father. Now, over the past few years, I've heard the phrase to describe what's going on around us. And it's the world. This world's on fire. And this world's on fire. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are living an extraordinary period of global conflict. Amen? Amen. Anybody who don't agree with that, you're part of the problem. Because you got your head in the sand. When you got your head in the sand, the devil's going to kick your butt. He's going to come upon you. You won't see it. So we need to wake up and listen to God's words. Amen? In Europe and Russia, we hear this on the news all the time. Russia and Ukraine are in the midst of one of the continent's deadliest wars since 1945. So they tell us on the news. In Africa, the last few years has seen some devastating wars in Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan, so they tell us. In the Middle East, of course, there's Israel's record-breaking bomb, record bombing of Gaza and the unfolding crisis in Yemen, to name a few that I've been studying on. Things are happening globally. A political scientist at the University of Chicago wrote in the Atlantic that we're in the midst of not a war, but a world war. That's the spiritual war we're talking about, brothers and sisters. It's here. Yeah. It's here. We've been in wars before, but we have to look, read between the lines, connect the dots, get in the Word of God and prepare ourselves. Amen? Amen. The climate crisis, inflation, political polarization, they all, they, that's a recipe for troubled hearts. If you think long, you're thinking wrong about this stuff. You don't let this indwell into you. We go to God. We go to God for our protection, for our knowledge, for our direction. Because right now, people are anxious, amen? They're depressed. A lot of them are depressed. Some people are, a lot of people are purely stressed out. Amen? What's going on in our world? What does the future hold? There's que that's questions that most of us wrestle with on a very, fairly regular basis. And now I'm going to share a little something with you. You might not have thought same questions the disciples were wrestling with. Just a different time. In our lesson this morning, chapter 14 opens with Jesus seeking. He's seeking to reassure His disciples. Because what has He done so far? He's washed their feet. Amen? He's washed their feet. He predicted that Judas would betray Him. And sure enough, Judas slipped out in the night with evil intentions on my head. Thinking a little booger. 
going to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But Jesus knew that. He knew that. And He let things work out because of His glory for what He had intentioned for us in a later time. Jesus told His disciples He'd be with them in just a little, just a little longer and where He's going, they can't come yet. He didn't say yet, but He said they can't come. He's also foretold Peter of his upcoming denial. Can you imagine? The Apostle Peter said, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. He says, you do love me, Peter? He said, yeah, three times. Well, Peter's getting pretty bowed up about it, swelled up. He said, you know what? For the rooster crow in the morning, you'll deny me three times. For, for the rooster crow three times, you'll deny me. I'm sorry. Well, on about daylight, a little before the rooster, three times. Where was Peter? He doesn't get out. He doesn't get out. He denied Jesus Christ. Well, no wonder the disciples are troubled. Because the ground is shifting beneath their feet, amen? When all this is happening. And Jesus responds to their anxiety by saying, We've heard this up on this pulpit and in your Bible many times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He's got it. You believe in God, believe in me is what Jesus says. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in God? Boy, you can chew that up, ponder, swallow it. Now that's that's some good that's some good scripture right there. And the word Jesus uses for believe in me in John 14 can also be translated as trust me. Keep on trusting me. No matter what happens. Trust me, your Savior. Trust me, Jesus, your King. Trust me, Jesus, your Forgiver. Trust me, Jesus, your Healer, your Lord. Jesus is calling His disciples back to the fundamental, grounded relationship of trust that He's been forging on them, been working with them. Let that baby go, He's all right, for as long as they've been following Him. And Jesus looked at these guys, He knew that His words weren't quite getting through. He knew it. These disciples have been with Him three running years and still their little thick skulls had, and their hearts hadn't received it all. But the day is coming. He knew how disturbed they were and how upset they was. And He knew what was causing it. That's our Lord. He's having fun, I can tell you. He also knew the remedy for all this. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning or many this morning who are suffering from the same misery the disciples were suffering from. Troubled hearts. Anybody in here, you don't have to raise your hand. Anybody suffering from a troubled heart or a fearful heart? Upset? Disturbed? Agitated hearts? Because of what's going on in our lives or in the world or both? Jesus knew the disciples were afraid of what's coming. Here's where I might hit a nerve. They were afraid of what's fixing to happen. They were afraid of what's coming down the pipe. They were afraid of death. They're human flesh right then, amen? Afraid of death. I'm going to ask you a question. If you feel brave enough, raise your hand. If you don't, if you won't pray about things, are you afraid to die? No. Right now. No. Are you afraid to die? Do you have hesitations at all? No. If, you're within, if the Lord is within you, yeah. and you're within the Lord, you should not be afraid to die. Peter Pascal's not afraid to die. I've looked death in the eye before. I'm not afraid of it. I have a relationship with Jesus. And that's the only way we're going to get there. One-on-one -on -one with Jesus. Not one-on-one -on -one as a group with Jesus. One-on-one, -on -one, you and Jesus. Amen. That's the Savior. That's what the Savior wants in us, brothers and sisters. They were afraid that they, with Him, were going to be executed. Now Jesus knew He was going to be executed. He went on with it anyway. But they were afraid of the same thing. They knew about the opposition that had grown against them in Jerusalem. The bitter, bitter hatred of the Pharisees. And their determination to eliminate Jesus and all His followers, the disciples, the apostles. And they knew they were in danger, so their hearts were troubled. But listen, more than the physical danger to themselves, they were fixed on His words about leading them. I would bother me some too if I'm, I'm in that position and Jesus said He's fixing to go and you can't come. You're leaving me. Where are you going, Father? He's telling them. Now they're letting fear take over where they ought to let God's words permeate their hearts.
Because this struck terror in their hearts, thinking they're going to be separated from Jesus. They'd have to go on living without Him. And that was unbearable. He'd been their sole protector, their sole confidant, their Lord, their Savior. They've learned about this. Jesus says to them again, don't let your hearts be troubled. You ever seen anybody so calm and easy going as Jesus Christ unless He was clearing the temple of money changers? Now, he could get mad. He could break a whip and go to pop and bats as good as anybody. But he did that in the temple. But all the other times, terror was before him. Troubles were before him. He was calm because he knew. And he had advice. He had words for his people. When I was a kid, I had a reoccurring fear in my life. See, my parents, they, they had me when they was pretty young. But even at that, when I was about the size of my grandson back there, he's six, I got to thinking, what am I going to do if my mom and daddy die? That bothered me. That bothered me a lot. And uh, I just did, I was just afraid I'd have to live life without them. And then when I read this in the scripture, I can, I can relate to that fear. But you know what? My mom and dad lived to a pretty ripe old age. And I got to be with them that, all that time. Now, when I graduated from high school and got out and when I was 18 years old, my mama couldn't stand the thought of not having no kids there. Little did she know she'd have two wagon old grandkids later. But when I was 18, she adopted a young girl. Her name was Tanya Renee. As far as I'm concerned, she's just as much my blood sister as it could ever be. She's my family. Mom got her. I don't know how old mom was then. She was 19 when she had me. That was 18 years later. So she got her a new daughter. Adopted this young girl, beautiful young girl. Sometimes she's a little snotty. Big brother has to take hold. But the love was there. And, I, and mom and dad lived to be that older age and I was worried about that. It troubled my heart as a kid. I even had nightmares about it. And I thank you Jesus, they lived till I was grown and they could see their grandkids some of the grandkids. God is good. God is good. He says, do not do not let your hearts be troubled. Let's look at them three words. Do not let. The words do not let indicates that the disciples can do something about their problem. You can do something, brothers and sisters. They held in their own hands the key to their release from heart trouble. Burdened heart. It's possible, they, it's possible they can let it happen or not let it happen. We are under the authority. We are under Jesus. Amen. I think Jesus is saying that to all of us in this room as well. There's a way out of our heart difficulty. The distress and anxiety that concerning both life and death, Jesus gives the answer. Keep on trusting me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it weren't so, I'd have told you that I'm, if I'm going to I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I wonder what my cabin looks like. I'm still thinking, you know, I love cabins. I don't care if it's a mansion with golden floors. I want to be with Jesus, but I'm thinking He loves me too. And somebody, He's a He's a He's the owner of a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> Maybe I could be one of them cabins out there in the pasture. Who knows what blessings? What glory God's going to give us. And he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me. So you can go where I'm going. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And it's kind of funny because Doubt and Thomas, he took that quite literally. Here, here he goes again. He wants directions. He'd like to get a road map. If there was such a thing as GPS coordinates back then, he'd probably want some of that. But that's Thomas. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I wonder if he put a death coming at the end of that. Probably not. I'm just thinking like Taylor would talk. But Jesus responds, saying that he himself is the way. He says, I'm the way. He says, I'm the truth. He says, I'm the only way, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's Jesus' words. And this statement by Jesus is a bona fide died in the leather hard, concrete, tight, hard, and fast promise. He won't tell you something that's not a promise and he won't he'll keep it. 
Jesus himself is all they need. There's no need to panic. No need to search desperately for a secret map. Jesus says, if you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. Well, in Greek, this statement is a condition of fact, meaning that the condition is understood to be true. If you really know me, and you do, you know my Father as well. Do you know Jesus? Or do you know of Jesus? Let's ride on that horse for a while and we'll get back to that later. There can be no misunderstanding, Jesus adds, from now on, you do not know Him and have seen Him. When He leaves, you do not know that He's not going to be here. You know He's not going to be here, but you have seen Jesus Christ. The, the disciples have, the apostles have. Amen? So He says, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Now Jesus went up to be beside His Father, and He promised us a Helper, the Holy Spirit. That's a promise made, a promise kept, and a promise happening right now. But you know what? This time it's Philip who ain't quite convinced. Daddy Thomas had his little say so. And Philip says in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. What? And this has been the mission of Jesus to make known the Father, to reveal who God is and what God is like. Don't you know me, Philip, even, ever, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Jesus asked. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Look here. You see me, you see the Father. I know I'm sure Jesus didn't do all the antics that I used, but I want to stress this point. He was serious. He was serious. Hmm. How does that make you feel, brothers and sisters? Does it calm you hard any knowing these scriptures are true? It does, man. Not having a troubled heart shouldn't be seen as a promise of a trouble-free life, though. Because we're going to come down with things like cancer. We're going to come down with things like pneumonia, heart attacks. We're going to have things that the enemy puts upon us. We're going to have troubles financially. We're going to have troubles in our marriage. We're going to have troubles forgetting the past which we have been forgiven of. Of course we'll have troubles, but these troubles aren't to drive us into fear. And that's because we trust God in Jesus. Jesus wants us to know, brothers and sisters, the only thing that should trouble our hearts is separation from Him. And His words about preparing a place should take care of that. I'm looking at, okay, I'm going home, no separation ever again. For eternity. You might be thinking, what do you mean by that, Taylor? Well, Jesus tells the disciples and us Something important about where he's going. And he's going to the Father. He's going to God Himself. And to the Father is more about a relationship than it is a place. Relationship. Y'all keep that word in your mind. Relationship. You can be married and go to a house. You can have your home. But that relationship is more than that home. Amen? That relationship between two is more in a place or a location. The many dwelling places aren't about changes in geography, but changes of heart. That's what he's talking about. It's an ongoing thing because it's already happened as soon as we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and begin to trust in Him. Amen? Amen. But it's a future of hope as well. Again, we understand the disciples are unsure about how to get to where Jesus is going, but He assures them that He is the way. He's the way. He is the path. He's the road to get to heaven. The way means the way of life. Trusting in Jesus is the way that leads to the Father. Trusting in Jesus is the way of life where transformation happens in us. Trusting in Jesus changes our hearts from troubled hearts to peace-filled hearts. I have a peace in me that you can, if you haven't, if you don't know Jesus, you can't understand. I have a peace in me. I'm not worried about nothing. Now sometimes I get irritated and I get aggravated and think, but I'm not worried. I have no fear about what's coming because Jesus will take me, brings me to it, He brings me through it. And the one thing, I, this wasn't in my notes, but I want you to realize that you're not protected 
Even with a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not 100% protected against what the enemy is going to throw on you. Because it, it may be death. Remember Job? God told Jesus, God told you, uh, Satan, do anything you want to, my man, but don't kill him. Okay? Do anything you want to. Don't kill him. And he'll show you he is a believer. He's trusting in me. He walks with me. Job went through total hell in this fleshly life. But he stayed true to God. And he was a thousand times over. He was blessed after that. Satan didn't win. He won't win with us, brothers and sisters. We're not going to be protected against things on this earth as things have to happen for God's glory. But we're going to, what what talking about, maybe I'm talking out of school here. When I'm talking about eternal life, that's what I'm after. I'm not talking about eternal life on this thing and earth ain't going to happen. I'm not talking about being protected. I've been shot once. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I've been shot. Knocked me down. I thought it was over with. It wasn't. But Jesus used that for an example for me to get up and rejoice in Him. Okay? And I wanted to lay hands on the boy that shot me. But I prayed for him. That's what Jesus tells us to do. Now, there's going to be time when you have to stand up and you may have to take a life. Jesus has warriors. I want you to know this. People ask me sometimes, is, will soldiers go to hell for killing somebody? How many times in this Bible did Jesus send troops out? How many times did He send warriors out to eradicate evil? To take it out. Men, women, child, animals, the whole thing. So there's no lineage left of that evil. Amen. We fight when we have to fight. We stand up against Satan in his evil ways. Period. Jesus leads us to ministry. And that's what gives us hope in this mixed up and crazy world where everything seems to be on fire. Not only to make it through, but to run the race in victory. Amen? Making a positive difference with our lives. If we take hold of Jesus' hand and goes where He leads us. I've got men in here I don't know all you men, but what men I do know and I run with, I respect highly. You are men of integrity. And what I've seen, you're men that love the Lord. And you'll stand in the gap for your family. You'll stand in the gap for Him. You may not be Billy Graham or, or a, a great singer, but you're standing in the Word of God. And that's what He asks each and every one of us to do. Whether it means going to the jails, visiting the prisoners, taking care of the sick, feeding the hungry, or giving a cold drink of water or a cup of coffee to someone who's thirsty. I'm a great example of Operation Clifton this morning. Servanthood. Servanthood of those that can make it down there and helping people that need help. This is how Jesus can say, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Now if it's true that Jesus is literally going to be with the Father in heaven and return one day to this earth, it is true. To create, recreate all things, making a new heaven and a new earth. But in the meantime, He's also with us, leading us and dwelling in us. Amen? He's coming back. We ain't here yet. We need to prepare for it. But how's this? If I was to read on in chapter 14, we would see Jesus say, I will ask the Father. He will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever. And that is the Spirit of Truth. You know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. What words from our Savior. What great words from our Lord and King. Because I live, you will also live. It don't get no better than that. On that day, you will, leave, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Where are you stepping right now, brothers and sisters? Are you stepping out for Jesus Christ, knowing this? It begins now as we learn to trust Him. I'm going to close with this. We're going to pray. That's how I'm going to close this out. Lord Jesus, Father, our hearts are troubled, but we don't want them to be, and you don't want us to have troubled hearts. Amen. 
This is why you have come to this world, Father, to show us the Father in heaven and prepare a place for us in your Father's house through your death and resurrection, Jesus. Lord, we want to trust in you. We want to make our lives in you. And Jesus, in your name I pray that you change us. Father God, enable us to believe more and more and more. Take our hand, Lord Jesus, that we may never ever let go of your hand. In Jesus' name and for your sake we pray this. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you have questions, if you have anything at all, at any time, please call. Please talk to us. The, my, myself, the lay pastor, ex-lay pastor, ex-elders, these men of God can talk to you and assure you what the truth in God's Word is. Thank you for coming to God's house today because His truth will set you free and the truth will not change. Amen? See y'all next Sunday. It'll, be a, it'll probably be a little bit better weather and a big crowd, but you know what? We had the perfect storm today, didn't we? In the perfect crowd. In Jesus' name. Love y'all.